So, the particle de Dieu is the French uh, name for the God particle. Uh, well, I'm going to talk to you about the famous God particle. First of all, uh, it's not the God of the particles or it's not the particle of God. Let's talk about the name. Uh, its proper name, the Higgs boson, comes from uh, the... Well, just yesterday we, we, we got this information, Mr. Higgs and Mr. François Engler from Belgium got the Nobel Prize 2013. Uh, happy news. So the name comes from the Scottish physicist Peter Ware Higgs. Well, the other name, the popular name, the God particle, comes from, again, from the famous Nobel Prize physicist Leon Lederman's book. Well, we can say uh, an innocent marketing strategy. Uh, Mr. Lederman wrote a book and uh, probably his publisher decided to give a spectacular name to that and instead of goddamn particle, they gave the God particle. But uh, it has nothing to do with the God. So, what is the importance of Higgs boson or uh, the God particle? So, all these gentlemen try to find a way to explain how the broken symmetries affects the physical systems. That's why we call uh, this system as A, B, E, G, H, H, K, apostrophe T, H mechanism, because these are the uh, initials of all these gentlemen. Anderson or was the, we can say, the father of this uh, phenomena. And uh, Mr. W uh, Peter Higgs uh, decided to add uh, Gerard Hoff to the list. So if Mr. Higgs says, we have to admit that. This is the name of the mechanism. So the mechanism basically explains if you broke the symmetry of some potential, let's say, okay, in your calculations, there appear some term. And you explain this term as mass. We will come to that. So we have standard models. Many of you probably heard about the standard model. But what is the standard model? Is it standard or something like that? No. It's, the, it's a set of theories that we explain the fundamental particles and their interactions. And what are these uh, fundamental particles? I think calling particles as, as fundamental or elementary is rather a bold claim. Okay? You, can, you can never call a particle as fundamental. Because, for example, the periodic table of elements. Uh, people in the beginning of the 20th century, these are the list, this is the list of our fundamental particles, okay? We knew that the ultimate uh, constituents of the matter were these. But suddenly, not suddenly, in a progressive way, physicists dis discovered that atoms are made of even smaller particles. Inside the at atom, there are protons and neutrons, and of course, the electron orbiting around the nucleus. Now, at that time, these are the three fundamental particles for humankind. Then it didn't take too long for us to discover that there are even smaller particles which constitute the protons and neutrons and other stuff. I always call standard model as the chemistry of 21st century. It's like the chemistry, okay? You have a table, you have fundamental particles, and your task is this. You have to explain how these particles can stay together, how these particles can interact, okay? And how these particles can transform from one into another. And the set of theories which explain all this stuff is we call standard model. In standard model, these are the all particles we have if uh, we cannot count the supersymmetry, which is not our topic today. The purple ones are the quarks, and the green ones are the leptons. Lepton means uh, thin or small in Greek. These are the fermionic particles. Actually, this is the list of fundamental particles we see around us, matter particles. 
Okay? Everything we can interact are made of these particles. And the question is this, how these particles can interact with each other? Is this some kind of magic? Is there, rope? is there a rope between them? How, for example, an electron can repel another electron? With magic? No. The paradigm of standard model particle physics is this. Every particle can interact via some particle exchange. Let me go back. The pale blue boxes are the bosons, these exchange particles. They are the messengers, messengers of the interactions. So, let me give you a simple analogy. For example, two skaters on ice. Can they change their place without touching them, touching to each other? Can they? Yes, they can. Without, without touching to each other, they can just throw a bowling ball because it's heavy. They can throw the bowling ball to the other and the other throw it back and then back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They can get far and for, further away from each other without touching. So the bowling ball actually is the exchanging particle in the standard model point of view. This is how we explain the repulsion. Can we give, well, can we explain the same thing with the same analogy, uh, the attraction? Can we explain the attraction with the same analogy to skaters on ice without touching? Yes, we can. For example, they can throw a boomerang, okay? If I throw my boomerang to this side, okay, I will go back because of the conservation of momentum. And the boomerang will go and turn back to the other skater. And it's going to take the boomerang from the other side. And when he, takes, when he catches the boomerang, he's going to move a little bit to the other one. Okay, if they, uh, co if they carry on this process so long, they are going to get closer to each other. Actually, they are changing their momenta via some particle. Okay, this is exactly how fundamental particles interact. For example, this is a very simple Feynman diagram. This is a pictorial uh, way of understanding how particles are interacting. This is basically the Coulomb repulsion. Maybe some of uh, engineering students may know Coulomb repulsion. So an electron is emitting a photon and the other electron absorbs this photon. But these electrons are not aware of each other, okay? An electron actually continuously emits and absorbs electron. It's like <laughs> continuously. But when the other electron comes closer, okay, the probability of the other electron absorbs the photon emitted by the other one increases. That's how we explain the inverse square law. And this phenomena, this phenomenon happens all the time from the beginning of time for all charged particles. And we call it in our daily lives electromagnetic. Electromagnetic is one of the fundamental forces in, in the standard model. But there are also other forces. For example, the strong force. The strong force is actually this. Inside the nucleus, there are a lot of protons which uh, positively charged, which are positively charged. So have you ever asked why, uh, how come these positively charged particles stay together uh, in a very tiny place? Because they're all positive. They have to repel each other. But there is another interaction between them. They can exchange some other particle. We call it gluon. It glues the uh, quarks together or protons together inside the nucleus. And of course, from the name, you can understand, the strong force is way stronger than the electromagnetic force. And also there's weak, I don't want to say force because it's not a force, it's just an interaction, weak interaction. It makes the nuclear decay possible. Okay, some quarks may transform into another quark changing to, uh, for example, neutron can decay into proton, which means neutron transforms into proton via this weak decay. 
So weak decay make, makes the nuclear decays possible. And there's also this gravity. Unfortunately, we don't have, we cannot explain the gravity in a quantum mechanical manner, which means that we cannot explain the, gravity, uh, the attraction between uh, two masses via particle exchange. There's a hypothetical particle called graviton to explain it, but we haven't seen a graviton in an, ex in an experiment yet. Uh, well, it's strange. Gravity is the oldest force we are aware of, but it's still the uh, force we, le we know less than the others. So, where is Higgs in this story? Well, according to the standard model, these pale blue ones, the bosons, they do not, well, from the standard model, the theory does not need them massive. In the theory, these exchange bosons has to be massless. But they have mass. In uh, 1933, it's one year later than I was born, okay? Uh, w and Z bosons are discovered at CERN in UA1 and UA2 collaborations, uh, experimental collaborations, and they found that the bosons, which has to be massless, they're massive. Okay? So, but the prescription was already given by these gentlemen. If you add a field, okay, if you uh, speculate a hypothetical field that permeates all the space, entire space, okay, you broke the symmetry of your potential, let's say, and this explains why these two particles are massive. So the crucial point is to find a way to explain the masses without screwing up all, all the other uh, theories. Okay? You, you have to do an adjustment to the theory. But that, well, adding a, a hypothetical field to your theory costs you something. Why? Because uh, whenever you, in particle physics, if you add some field, you have to find an associated particle. Actually, what we call as particle, for example, electron, or the other particles are actually the excitations of some field. Electron actually, the particle electron, is the excitation of the electron field. Okay? If you have a field, you have to have a particle. And if you want to explain the masses of these bosons, you have to add a field. But if you add a field, you have to have your associated particle. And this particle called Higgs. That's why in Large Hadron Collider, people build giant uh, Hadron Colliders, which, which is Large Hadron Collider, and they waited for a Higgs boson to show up. Why? Because it's something like that. Suppose you have a billion-sided dies, okay? This is, for example, 24-sided dies, okay? In particle physics, uh, this, is an, also, this is also an analogy. You have a billion-sided dies, okay? You roll the dies and you are looking for a particular sign. Okay, somebody, some theorists give you a sign. Look, if this sign exists on, the, on one of the sides of this billion-sided dice, okay, and you have to roll at least a billion times. But <laughs> there is one more complication. Whenever you roll the dice, the sign disappears far quicker than blink of an eye. Okay, you have to roll the dice as many times as you can, okay, which means you have to collide protons many times, years, five years, ten years maybe. And then you have to find the particular decay of this Higgs. For example, this is exactly how uh, is Atlas, Atlas is an experimental collaboration at CERN. This is how Atlas guys find the uh, Higgs particle. You see, this blue line actually tells us the number of photon-photon pairs coming from the standard model. And the excess tells, look, there is something more in nature than you expected. But the question is this. 
what is the probability of having this excess by chance? Okay? You can also have this excess by chance without violating your theory because you, 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 you're analyzing a number of events. Okay? You're not the, the quantum, probabilistic quantum nature of uh, the theory uh, may be delusive. But the probability of having this excess by chance is one in a million. Okay? It's one in a million, which means that we are pretty sure about that there is Higgs. And that's why they gave the Nobel Prize to, to these uh, two gentlemen. And, uh, well, what is the importance of Higgs? People are always asking this question. What are we going to do with Higgs? Are we going to find a cure to cancer? Are we going to, to make the time travel possible? Are we going to uh, uh, find the te teleportation? No. It's scientifically, it fits. OK, the standard model has a missing piece. And it fits to that hole very perfectly. That's why it's important for us, for scientists. Because you have a huge theory, powerful theory, that explains everything almost perfectly, but it has a missing part, okay? Suppose you're doing puzzle and you, you have one missing part and you found the missing part, okay? This is an exciting uh, point for you. But in my humble opinion, in daily life, okay, it's like giving a K-man a computer and asking what to do with, with this computer. Okay, what are we going to do with, with the Higgs? I don't know, I'm like the K-man. I don't know what to do with Higgs. Probably we are not, not, not we, our children, our grandchildren, maybe grand-grand-grandchildren will not be able to find a way to make use of Higgs. Thank you.